little bit of background about me. I worked for a company named uh, Jure in New York City that did fashion technology. And I spent, you know, a year, a little over a year, working almost exclusively with um, GraphQL uh, at sort of the API level with Django and, and Python, Postgres on a, a legacy product that had found market product market fit, but then needed to scale. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start at the beginning of a sort of a developer's journey, learning about GraphQL, learning what that means in the Django ecosystem and what that means in the broader API ecosystem, and then sort of the choice that they need to make when they make a new product. So what is GraphQL? You know, we've all heard it. If you haven't used it, it's sort of a thing that people talk about. All the all the cool kids are talking about it. But what what does that mean? So overall, GraphQL is treating your API like treat a database. There's a lot of overlap. You have the same objects at every layer of the stack. Uh, makes front end development very easy uh, because you already have all the objects in their proper format. And loading it into your you know, data stores is very easy and everybody's talking the same language from your product managers all the way down to your people that manage your database it's, it's a very big unifying force for or an organization you know, the problem with that obviously is it's become centrally planned so that you need like a, a, an api czar or like a grumpy db admin who tells no to everybody it can very easily turn into that um, so you need to sort of have the training wheels set up early so that people can onboard and learn. But that's the overview. And so now imagine we're, we're a, a software engineer picking to start a new project. Here are your possible stacks. Um, assuming everybody here uses Django, likes Django, likes Python, likes the Python ecosystem. If you don't and you're here, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe someone made you come here. I, I don't know. But possible stacks, you got Django, basic Django, template language, everything's easy. Uh, Django REST, if you want to start a front end app, you, know, you don't necessarily have to use Django REST framework, but most people do, sort of the lingua franca of REST at this point. And then you have Django and Graphene and Django Graphene and GraphQL Core, there's a whole bunch of libraries. It's all one stack, it's inside in the GraphQL Python organization. And then if you want to play with API, uh, GraphQL API, the other option is you know, some of the services that are provided where you give them a database and they give you an API back. So let's, let's take a look at the different choices. Django REST, you know, the, you know the drill. Most people have done this. It's easy. It's also a bit boring. There's all the challenges have been solved. You can just sort of get it done. Uh, Django and GraphQL is new and exciting. You know, you want GraphQL, you also want stuff like pandas or all the other stuff that comes with the Python ecosystem. And, you know, Python, and you want, you want a new challenge. And then there's the GraphQL as a service where, you know, try something out, step outside of your comfort zone and go, go no code to build an API. That's another option. So let's start with a basic uh, example more or less pulled from the tutorial. You have your models, cookbook recipe, foreign key, and then you have your object types. Ignore the data loader stuff for now. I didn't feel like copying and pasting a bunch of different stuff, but just imagine you have recipes and then you have your resolved recipes and it's get all of them and then you know you got your different types and they correspond one to one with your database objects, which in a new project is generally how it goes. So let's, let me do a little bit of not quite live coding. I pushed these samples on Heroku. And so you'll see we've, we're running this query and it, it takes a while. There's, you're, you're fetching, you know, 5,000 rows, but that shouldn't take four seconds. So why is that? Let's go back into the presentation. So the theme of these talks is n plus one problem. So you can see what it is. And if you look at the 
code, you can figure it out. So for each object in your query that you've generated, you've fetched all your cookbooks, and then for each cookbook, you're doing a join. You're fetching the recipes associated with that. Now, n plus one, classic n plus one. The problem here with GraphQL is n plus one is almost a feature. Um, you got to figure out how to get around it with um, REST, like the first talk was, was discussing. If you're careful, you can avoid it, but you need to solve the n plus one problem with, with, with GraphQL. I'm sorry. So the answer is, is data loaders. And so data loaders are a concept for batch loading. They're described a little bit in the tutorial, but they aren't given, um, so they're not first class citizens, and they should be because they, that's what they become. So what do data loaders do? They say, for each one of these cookbooks that I'm getting, save it, go to the next one, and then at the end, I'll get all the recipes for all the cookbooks in one single query. Um, and that requires asynchronous programming. The promises is the library in, uh, written by the, uh, the original author of, of these libraries. And so you can see we have um, data loaders attached to each Django request. If you look, you know, they, they're sort of standard foreign key data loaders, reverse foreign key data loaders for the different type of lookups where you can just provide it and it'll get done. This is code I, I wrote and I've used on multiple projects. Um, and so what you can do is you can attach it to the request and then you can implement them and it's pretty simple. And then if we go back, sorry, I'm jumping around here, we can see We've got our little beta loader resolver on this object. So now it should batch much more quickly. And another bit of live coding here. If we do recipes with data loader, should be a bit quicker. Should be. Who knows with the reference? It's 1.7 seconds instead of four seconds. Now, for this data, it's still a bit slow. Like you look at the size of the return shouldn't take 1.7 seconds. Now, why is that? So if you look at um, if you look at the project as a whole, it's not very opinionated. You have to figure out a lot of this yourself. You have to write a lot of framework code. This is essentially framework code here. And there's some very good blog posts and, and things written how to do it. But imagine if you're a developer starting out, like the, the first guys were saying, we didn't have the overhead in the organization to support this new technology and sort of learn how to do it ourselves. So you say, okay, I see that we don't get a lot for free. This is really cool. I'm learning new concepts, doing asynchronous programming all of a sudden now, which is really cool. This is a possibility they're endless, but I want to build a product. So let's see what other options are out there for me to build a product. So let's look at the renting versus building uh, question. So this is Hasura. This is API as a service. I just picked the first one on Google. And let's do a quick little comparison. Now, for benchmark purposes, this is deployed to Heroku same size instance and actually pointing at the same data source and running the exact same query. And if we look at that, it takes 151 milliseconds to do a little bit of DNS resolving and then afterwards 47 milliseconds to do the rest of them after it sort of figures it out. So we're talking you know, two orders of magnitude better than the base install of Django. GraphQL, and this took less time to set up. So in, in addition, if you look, you can see you get a lot of stuff for free. For example, 
from experience implementing aggregates or all sorts of filtering and ordering and all of these, these are essentially database operations that you're doing. In GraphQL, you can see distinct limit offset, you know, where they literally let you run database queries here, which has its downsides or not. But if you look at the browser for Django GraphQL, Django Graphene, you don't quite get all of those features. So now it's decision time. Um, what, what do you want to do? What are your goals with the project in using GraphQL? Is your goal to learn GraphQL? If it is, then do Django and GraphQL. It's very rewarding, uh, very, very interesting. And there's a huge amount of open source work being done to bring Django GraphQL up to speed uh, to some of these services. They're releasing Graphene 3 soon. There's, there's a roadmap for that. And there's a massive amount of opportunity for open source growth. Um, I think some of these things that I've written will end up hopefully in PRs. Um, you could do Django REST, it's what you know. Uh, there's sort of a concept of innovation tokens where you only have so many in a project and if you spend them on tech, you'll never build your product. It's, it's a, from a talk called Boring Technology. It's a, it's a great talk. So, and then there's the GraphQL as a service. And you know, everything as a service could go out of business, they could be down, you don't own your own thing, but it's essentially no code. So if you want to play with GraphQL and or Django, those are your decision points. Um, so I didn't want to go too in depth and it's also running a bit late. I could talk forever about this. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. And then sort of in the spirit of the jokes, I thought I'd end on a meme. Sorry, here we go. So here's the end. Sort of figure out where you stand on this, uh, this spectrum here. And that's it. Sorry, I wasn't following the questions as they went. Uh, is using GraphQL Graphene save any work over design schema and Django REST framework? DRF makes it so easy to design an API. So is it as easy in graphing or the savings most in the consumer side querying our back end? Um, the savings are generally all on the consumer side. Building front end and serving clients is incredibly easy from GraphQL. There's something called Apollo Client, which has a bunch of different things where I have had front end developers actually say, I never knew my job could be so easy or enjoyable. Um, so I think that answers that. Uh, in addition, if you build a GraphQL API and you succeed, you will eventually have to build a REST API, either on top of it or in some other way, because an external API needs to be REST in this, at this point in time. Um, so what do you think about using GraphQL and REST APIs? I've seen some people try to make that work and fail. Either GraphQL is a gateway to the REST endpoints or the reverse. Um, I think it's possible. It's sort of your direction of your arrows. Like you can have like REST, GraphQL. Like they shouldn't flow through each other ideally. You can do it, but realistically they should connect to like a service layer or just the database below beneath it. And then the service layer above your database connects to both um, REST and GraphQL. That's nice in theory, but in practice it's always a little bit messy. Um, I code a mutation for every CRUD operation in this table. Do you have some tips to optimize this? Yeah, that's another downside of GraphQL is you sort of throw away a lot of the things you take for granted with REST with um, the, the C and U and D. The mutations are very unopinionated and REST is very opinionated, which provides you guardrails. I would say to optimize this, um, like treat your mutations as um, REST operations, honestly. And then the get will just be the, the query itself that I demonstrated. Um, obviously it's more complex, but keep thinking in REST and CRUD terms for mutations. Um, yeah, like yeah, that's, what's, that's what's good. You're gonna end up recreating a lot of REST in mutations. And the last question is, do you use Relay? If so, what's the advantages? What are the advantages? Um, I didn't use Relay because in this demo because I didn't want to complicate it. Yes, I have used Relay. That's what I did most of it in. Uh, Relay, for those who don't know, is a specif 
specification that provides unique identifiers to every single object, so it's easier to manage on the front end. Uh, and it's also pagination is a little easier. Um, I prefer Relay. There, we'll see what wins. This is a very new technology, and I think Relay or non-Relay are currently like in the, you know, React versus Angular kind of thing right now, and React is one. So we'll see. I'm waiting to see which one wins. Not exactly sure. Um, I, I I prefer it honestly. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.